This podcast is supported by Manitou Fund. We want to thank them for coming on board and, and helping to support this podcast. Really means a lot to us. Hey, everyone, you're listening to the Fieldwork Podcast. I'm Mitch O'Hora. My co-host, Zach Johnson, is in the fields here today. He's planting. I got some rain, uh, so I, you're stuck with me here for today's special episode amidst a global pandemic um, dealing here with COVID-19. Agriculture is one of the many parts of the economy that is really feeling the pain. You know, we've heard about dairy farmers dumping milk because of schools and food service being shut down and the infrastructure just isn't in place to move that supply through the grocery stores to the consumer. Corn prices are in a really tough spot because oil prices have tanked and that's directly impacting ethanol, of course. Meat packing plants are really struggling with workers being sick from COVID-19. Um, so new packing plants shutting down, other ones coming back on board. Now we're all just wondering what is next. So today on this special episode of Fieldwork, we're going to go beyond our usual focus on sustainable ag. We're going to talk a little bit more broadly about what's happening in farming right now. What should, be, what should we be worried about? What can we feel hopeful about? Where is this going to go from here? We're going to bring in expert Chip Flory. He's the host of AgriTalk Radio and really has some great insights for us on the pandemic situation. We're super excited to have him on the show. He's truly someone who has his finger on the pulse of all things in ag. Um, he hosts his two-hour show every single day covering agriculture, yep. news, and market information. Chip, great to have you on. Um, and uh, Mitchell, I'm glad to be here, man. I'm, I've been wanting to do your podcast for a while. You guys are doing a great job. You broke through. You're here. You made it. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Just a heads up, we recorded this episode on Friday, April 24th. So there might be a couple things that have changed since then. What's the latest? What's the latest on... COVID-19, what's going on right now? It's the labor issues at the packing plants, uh, Mitchell. There's no question about that. Just as we're getting started, we're confirming that that additional plants are going down. And before I go any further on that, Mitchell, I do want to say this. We can't forget it changes minute to minute, hour to hour. And some of the plants that have been down in the past are coming back online. Uh, Columbus Junction, in Southeast Iowa is a good example of that now. And that's been a fit and, and, you know, a, an on and off again, restart for the plant there, but at least they're taking some hogs. So it is the labor situation without a doubt that is uh, top of mind for, for most, for many, many producers out there. I, I won't say most, but you know what it's like here in the state of Iowa, Mitchell, good grief. If we see the the slaughter disrupted at the packing plants, it disrupts everything. So that's disrupting the entire supply chain, you know. So if you don't have anywhere to take your hogs to get them slaughtered, uh, the, you don't need to necessarily be feeding a lot of these hogs all this corn. And you've already got the corn on hand. It's in the bins. We're just getting in the field and planting right now. You know, we're months away from harvesting a new crop. So we have all this old crop that we're sitting on. And now we have high supply, low demand, yep. and obviously yep. the uh, the economics of it are taking a major hit because of that. How is so? But with these guys coming back on and kind of going on and off, like you alluded to, is this going to be able to bounce back quickly, or are we already past that point? No, no, no. There's not going to be a quick bounce back to this. I don't. I don't think that uh, that there's any question. It's going to take time. We need to make sure that the that the workers that go into those packing houses have the confidence that they need and deserve uh, to go in there and get to work and not be afraid of of um, of becoming infected with COVID nineteen. So it it it's going to take time. It's going to take testing and not just testing. Have you got the the virus? It's going to take testing to to determine have they had the virus and unknowingly had the virus because it sounds like there are many, many cases out there that that uh, the symptoms are light. Uh, you, you may have had it and not known it. And now we need to also figure out 
if you've had it, how much resistance does that give you to getting it again? If it if it's a high level of resistance, well, then those guys that have had it, I, they're going to march right back into those plants and get back to work. That's what they do. That's what they want to do. The people that work in those meatpacking plants, in a lot of cases, the reason they're here is because they want a better life for themselves. They want a better life for their families. They want to work. They're not they're not looking for an easy way out on this. They they want to earn it and they are earning it. And we need to give them the, the opportunity to get in there and, and, and do it. Yeah. Um, they're used to working hard no matter what the situation is. So they're, they're used to working through adversity, but the adversity that we're facing now, is it, so obviously there's a risk of the other employees and, and their families and everything. And that's, I think a big thing we need to get taken care of for sure. They need to have the mask. They've got to have those personal protection equipment. Uh, they've got to have the mask, the goggles, they, the, the plexiglass um, uh, separators, I guess, that, that separate the workstations on the lines. Those have got to be in place. These waivers that have gone on, Mitchell, on the, on the line speed, I think we need to question those and slow down slow down the lines because the we're, we're not in the business right now of maximizing output at the plants. What we're doing is, what we should be doing is making sure that we've got the maximum number of plants open and operational. Yeah, just keep making the progress that we need so that at least it's not fully disrupting the rest of the supply chain. Because like, cause like you're saying, you know, so there's, there's plants that are having to be shut down, but there's other ones that are coming back. But you're saying though that some of the damage has been done. It's going to be ongoing for a long time. Probably not only in you know pork, but obviously in the dairy industry and uh, in ethanol and stuff. So why is this not going to be a quick recovery? You know, quick being at least you know maybe three to six months type of quick recovery. What's going to happen there? Okay. Uh, yeah, it, just to, to finalize the point on the on the line speeds and everything, the, the goal here should be to make the best of a bad situation. And that I, I, I think if we get into that mode, it changes everybody's attitude just a little bit. So I, I think that needs to be the attitude going forward. OK, uh, and, and it will help now. As, as far as the timing on this, this goes, if we've got a medical end of the crisis, Mitchell, the, the talk was that the chloroquine was going to be the answer and, and that if you take the chloroquine, you're going to get over COVID-19 uh, quickly, quickly or quicker. Uh, now that's being questioned. They're looking at all the different answers that are out there for other medical conditions and seeing if it can be used to relieve some of the some some of the the symptoms of those that are reacting most violently to COVID-19 infection. That's good, but it's not as good as guys, we've got it. Here's the antidote. That's the news that everybody's waiting for. If we find that in a relatively short period of time, that's your V-bottom recovery. That's how you get that. But the way that things are going right now, developing the vaccine that's going to take time, developing the medical treatments on the, um, the typical path that, that these treatments would take, that takes time. I mean, we're not talking about three or six months. We need to be preparing for when flu season comes back in the in the fall, and does it bring COVID nineteen back with it? it? Those are the things that we need to be thinking about. So, so as a farmer is looking at preparing for that, okay. So, it sounds like pork industry, you know, kind of up and down. Probably not coming back anytime soon. Dairy would have a big impact there on schools and stuff like that being open, but. How did how are farmers approaching this right now? Are you seeing much for change being made? You know, as uh, farmers are getting in the fields. Yeah, dairy dairy industry um, 
when you look at some of the changes that are being implemented by the co-ops, you, the, you can see that some of the changes that are being implemented are designed to uh, design for some longer term cuts to production. And that's, that's discouraging. I mean, when guys, it, it's, it's been, dairy has been a get big, get big, get big, oh, get more efficient yeah. as, as they possibly can. So now when we're talking to these co-ops that are saying, listen, we need to find some way because even as the restaurants reopen, as food service starts to, to uh, uh, restart, <laughs> We we need we we were talking about giving the workers the confidence to go back into those those slaughterhouses. We need to give consumers the confidence to go sit in a restaurant. Sure, yeah, because that could be the problem. The restaurant can be open, but if people are worried about going in there and uh, being yep. back around people, then it doesn't yep. even matter if they're open if nobody's going to go. Exactly. So that that as that confidence slowly comes back to the consumers out there we can start to see some demand for some of these products that have been so, you know, just has, has been destroyed. And I'm thinking of things like, like butter for food service, creamer for food service, uh, bacon. I, you know, we, we consume a lot of bacon at home. The, the country does. But when you look at what, how bacon is used, at restaurants and in food service, it's a condiment, Mitchell. It's, it's like Bloody ketchup Mary. or pickles. Your Bloody Mary. Yeah, yeah, it it is a condiment. Yep, sure. Um, when we lose that, <laughs> that's huge. Because I, I I forget I was talking with Dad about that in all of the yep. pork bellies that are sitting in storage right now, you know, not able to be utilized and cured into bacon and such. Like that's a huge deal that that now it's affecting this supply and demand, you know, on both ends of the spectrum that we right. still have all this supply, but the demand is, is just being gone. So, so yeah. how does, you know, in dairy, obviously we're seeing that they're dumping milk to right. reduce the supply. And obviously that doesn't have a very long shelf life. So right. that's the problem there. Right. Dump it. I saw some people putting it on their fields and maybe trying to yep. use it. I mean, there's nutrients in it. There's enzymes in it. Um, yep. You know, maybe it can be good for, put it on the soil and maybe get some kind of a use out of it. But right. um, for these other facilities, I was talking to some buddies in the pork industry too on, you know, are they having to kill hogs and, you know, kill piglets and stuff that try to reduce um, the number of mouths to feed. Yep. The, there's the stories that nobody wants to talk about Mitchell. Um, and you, when you hear it, you kind of question it. Are they really, wasn't there a better option? Yeah, but no, can you imagine crazy. making that decision? No, it's, oh my god, it's just awful! Well, and it's just so much of you know the fruits of your labor just being yeah. gone. But what about in ethanol and you know for row crop that oil is people are having to pay to get rid of oil. My understanding <laughs> there is the refineries have to pretty much they have to stay open. They've minimized production as much as we can, both in ethanol yep. and in just regular oil refineries. So shut right. that down, but you can't necessarily turn those things off because they're so expensive right. to get back up and going. What's going on there? And I don't think a farmer's going to necessarily go out and killing hogs or, or other animals is awful, but going out and are we going to have to spray off millions of acres of corn and soybeans too? Oh boy, I, 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 I hope not. I really seriously, seriously hope not. You know, on the poultry side, you break the eggs. You just, you, you don't hatch them. Um, so there's that. It, on, on the milk side of things, yep, it, it sucks when you have to dump milk. But I, I had uh, Alyssa Badger from High Ground Dairy, an analyst uh, out of Chicago, on AgriTalk on, um, on Thursday, April 23rd. And... <laughs> She said, you know, we're, we're talking about everybody dumping milk, but we dumped more milk at this time in 2017 than what we are right now. Yep. Yep. Because of the, because of the, the fundamentals of the market in, in has changed so much in three years that 
we are making so much more use of the milk that is still available out there that the spring flush comes along every year. And in 2017, we actually had to dump more milk than what we are right now. But because of the situation with COVID, you've got mainstream media sure, that is picking up covering, on it covering and they're, tur sure. they're turning it into a story, Mitchell. Oh yeah. Well, and that's yeah. a lot of this. I mean, it, and it's a huge story to tell obviously. And it's right. totally, you know, consumed all thinking for the last, what, almost two months now. Yeah. Um, so what do we, and everything that I'm gathering from you is it's going to carry on for a long time. But in my eyes, what I've seen is farmers are basically saying, I can't necessarily go and worry about this right now. I got to get my crop in the ground. I got to keep going on business as usual. You know, are you seeing other changes being made there or, you know, does a farmer carry on business as usual or do they need to really take a step back and think about this and make some major changes? Yeah. Yeah. All good questions. And, and on the timeline that I'm talking about, I'm kind of assuming here, here's the reason that I'm saying that it's, that it's going to take a long time for us to get back out of this. It's because I haven't seen any evidence to suggest otherwise. As soon as I see some evidence that suggests that we're going to, yep, within three months, we're going to, the economy is going to be back and functioning. I'm going to get right on board with that as, as quick as I can. As far as farmers changing their, their plans, you, you get up into the Northern Plains and corn acres are moving from, from intended corn acres over to uh, spring wheat. Uh, wheat has been one of those commodities that has quote unquote benefited from the situation that we're in just simply because we've seen a lot of bread leave the shelves. We've seen a lot of flour leave the shelves um, with, with guys fill or with uh, families filling up pantries. Uh, so we've seen that. So we're going to see some acres move from corn to spring wheat in the Northern Plains. Unfortunately, the hit on cotton has been so destructive that we're going to see some acres in the South go from cotton to corn and soybeans. So I don't know if we're going to lose enough in the Northern Plains from corn to offset what we're going to gain in the South, but there's going to be some trade-offs there. You know, and, and we're, you know, primarily corn and soybeans on our farm, but we are trying some other crops and I've got some other options. So like we'll, we'll have corn, soybeans, rye, barley, and I just planted some mustard the other day and I've got a couple other potential crops and I'm looking, especially on some of my lower producing areas, you know, yeah. if I'm going to raise yeah. 45 bushel soybeans and you know, if they're going to make maybe eight and a half bucks, if I'm lucky, probably not even that much, I'm talking like $350 an acre in revenue. Like how does that, my, my land expense on it is more than that because it's, I just bought it a couple of years ago. It's on a, a mortgage, but like it just doesn't even work. Like not even close to working. Right. So, but, but it's like, how do I, how do I even do something else? You know, like it's, so I mean, I'm looking at it as do I plant soybeans that I know are not going to make money or do I not plant anything and I don't know what I would do there. Like you, right. you, you just don't plant it. And like, instead of losing money one way, you lose money another way. Like uh, yeah. it's just, I feel so stuck. I'm like, I don't know what to do. Yep. Yep. Tough situation. Have you, have you identified where you're going to market that barley, the rye, the mustard? It's all sold ahead of time. Yeah. So that's Amen. why I'm able to do it. Okay. So that yep. I would not, you. I can't go and plant something else without having to market for it. And and I'm in a lucky situation because of that. Okay. So Good. that's why I'm able to do this. The, the barley. No, no, no. Do not describe that as a lucky situation. That's planning. Well, it's planning, but, but I've positioned myself to be there to do it, but I'm, I'm grateful, I guess it, it's not luck. I'm grateful for having the yeah. opportunity to do Very that, good. but I don't know if I can necessarily scale that you know, to cover more of my acres that are corn and soybeans, like those crops I'm talking, that's still a relatively small percentage of my operation. I've a big percentage of, of my operation that we're looking at probably not making money. Not that it was really making money in the last couple of years though, either, but especially now, right? it looks real tough. 
Yeah, absolutely. I'm man, it encourages the heck out of me to hear you looking at those alternative crops out there. But the problem, Mitchell, how many of your neighbors are doing the same thing? None. Right. Right. I mean, God bless you for making the effort. Um, but until we see more and more of that happen, and I, I've been talking about the need for a for a viable third crop all um option in the in the middle of the country i've been crying for that for three decades now um with with a lot of this too okay so we we talk about sustainability on on field work here and to me sustainability only works if the farm is economically sustainable but now with all of this talk here how is conservation and some of those pushes going to be impacted um, because that profit margin really isn't there. Some of these other companies and the overall right. economy cutting back, what's going to happen to everything else? The, the infrastructure, the, the infrastructure, the focus on water quality, the focus on carbon, right. things like that. How, what's your view on those things? Man, I think it's all going to come into play, Mitchell, uh, precision conservation. Uh, it, it's a concept that, that, uh, pheasants forever, quail forever, and others have been talking about for a while now. Um, it, it is because this approach to conservation, and I think you know this, I'm a hunter. I, I, I love the habitat development that, that uh, has come back into the middle of the country over the, over the last 10 years, something like that. But at the same time, when we talk about the CRP and I, and, and we talk about the, uh, how it takes some of the spark out of the economic engines in rural America. I mean, I've not been that supportive of the CRP over the years because of some of the economic damage that it causes. Uh, but at the same time, I, I can, I understand and I use some of those CRP acres. But if we start talking about precision conservation, where you, you, you mentioned earlier that piece of ground where if you're lucky, you're going to get 45 bushel beans. Okay. What's wrong with taking that eight acre chunk out of an 80 acre field and putting it into the CRP and developing it for long-term conservation? Mm -hmm. um, because my payment on it is $450 per acre. That is okay. the problem. Right. Right. <laughs> and my, the land expense, my fixed cost in that is so high. And $450 right. an acre plus taxes. Right, right. But what if, what if the CRP program that you would enroll those eight acres in does pay 300 bucks an acre because you're going to go pollinator. Okay. Right. Okay. So you, you're going to have some expense and everything up front, but that's going to be a shared expense uh, to get those acres into the highest return conservation program that you possibly can. Now, you also have to look at, I'm not spending the money to put that, that crop in the ground. So there, I'm adding that to my bottom line. And I'm raising the average yield of the rest of my field, which means that I'm raising my APH longer term. So it's a, there's a lot of line items that need to be filled in on this conservation, on, on this precision conservation concept. So I think some people that may have a, granted, Mitchell, may have a lower cost per acre than- Yeah, most people bucks. don't have $450. Okay. Right. That was just because, right. so I bought, to clarify there, I mean, I bought this farm yep. in 2017 for a, a lot of money. So I, it's on a, you know, it's on a 20 year mortgage to get it paid off. So that's why it's so right. high. Most, exactly. our average across our farm is about $250 per acre. Okay. Is our average. So now we need to replace 250 bucks an acre. And, and even just taking those lowest yielding areas out of production, putting them into a long-term conservation plan. And I'm not talking about the whole fields, guys. I'm talking about pulling six, eight, 10, 12, whatever number it is that raises the overall efficiency and productivity of that field over time. Yeah, I like that that's precision be conservation piece. Yep, that's, that's, that's a concept that I think is going to gain some traction more and more Mitchell. Yeah. And that's kind of how we've approached, you know, like the barley or like the mustard and stuff. It's yep. we're not putting it on our best ground. 
Now, where we are doing some of the things on our better ground is like relay cropping, where I'm trying to get yep. two crops off the same acre. Now, that's where I might put it in a little bit better area. Last year, we had it in some crappier ground, and, and it worked really well, but um, we're trying it this year on some better producing stuff. But, but yeah, I think the wildlife stuff, actually, we've um, Iowa State and Pheasants Forever and Iowa DNR have a project going on down here in Washington County and our, around our farm where they're trapping pheasants and tagging them, um, GPS tagging them and monitoring pheasant nesting in cover crop fields. Cool. They've got a heat cool. seeking drone and stuff. It is super cool, but definitely seeing those numbers come back. So what yep. we're looking at is can we implement a longer term look at this? We actually put together, dad and I put together a seven year plan for our farm to look at where do we want to be in the future? How do we work towards that and be a little bit more holistically thinking towards, okay, how do I find different things for these farm ground acres? And now I've got this guy saying, Hey, you know, he wants me to not only do mustard and stuff, but dill and parsley and carrots and these other cool. weird things. I'm like, I've never even thought about being able to grow that, mm -hmm. but we're looking at like, why do we have to grow corn and soybeans? Like, yeah, we're set up to do it. We're not going to, we're not going to go away from farming corn and soybeans. That's going to be our main thing for sure. Right. But on some of our other ground, can I get it to work to do something else? If I have a market set up though, that's yep. a stable market and it's going to be able to get the revenue coming in so I can still be profitable and focus on profit, not focus on yield. Right. Right. All, I can't even add to that, Mitchell. That's, uh, that, that is really well put. I, I think a big thing of this for me is going to be how do I focus on profitability per acre and utilizing some of these conservation efforts like cover crops, for example, to drive profitability. Now, a piece of that, though, is be able to integrate livestock onto it or be able to harvest it like we're doing for, for rye or wheat, um, be able to intercede it earlier and use it to reduce my need for synthetic inputs. Absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah, the, everything that you talked about right there is, is some, we've always talked about cutting those costs, cutting those costs. And the, the message the last few years from, from producers, Mitchell has been, you know, yeah, we've been talking about that a long time, but there's not much meat left on that bone. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, there is. I mean, there is, we're... there is, we can still do it. But it's got to be looking at it as not just cutting cost that it that might reduce yes. some bushels, but it's looking at what's it actually do to my bottom line. Right, right. That's the point that yeah, yes, I'm, I I don't want to distract from that point at all. Maximizing the return. That's what it's got to be about, not maximizing yield. Yeah, going from the three hundred and fifty dollar bag of seed to the hundred and forty dollar bag of seed. Yeah, you're gonna lose some yield probably pretty consistently, but is the bottom line still better because right. of that? Right. Right. I'm not, what, boy, you're, you're on it, man. I know we're going to have to let you go. So what's, what's the final kind of takeaway here for farmers? What do we, where are we at today? What's the, what's the chip good word of the day here on where do we got to do? Okay. So we're out there farming on, we got to get out and, and, and get a crop planted. Um, cab time is think time for a lot of people. And so it's listen to the fieldwork podcast time. And and to listen to Agra Talk and to the Fieldwork <laughs> Podcast. Yes. But as you're doing that, as you're doing that, um, be thinking about what you were talking about. How are you going to maximize returns rather than than just maximizing yield? And and I get it. We're in a situation right now where the way that you increase revenue is grow another bushel. I, I get that. But what's that bushel costing you? And really examine it and find some meat, find the meat that is left on that bone to cut the cost. Because I, the, the, one of the saddest stories that I tell on seminars, Mitchell, is that a market has got two functions. And the corn market's function day to day is to discover the, the, the fair price. The second function of a commodity market is to make sure that the low cost producer is the one that's producing that commodity. So to do that, a commodity market will hold the higher cost producers underwater for a long enough period of time that the assets are redistributed 
to the lower cost producers. So let's find the that problem, way. And we better figure it out because right now the low cost producer is in South America. South America. So we better figure this out. Pandemic or not, that yep. is a huge topic that still we have to figure out no matter what. You know, I don't have to say this to farmers because they, it, it, it's just bred into them, but don't be the victim. Okay. Accept the challenge that, that uh, is before you and figure it out. I agree. Well, good stuff. I think we, uh, we better wrap things up there. Chip, this has been fantastic to have you on. I definitely look forward to talking to you again real soon. And, uh, but yeah, you've got to get back on the radio here. Yeah. We're going to have to do that pretty quick next time. Get the golfer on here too, so that I can talk a little bit of golfing. That sounds good. That's a reference (laughs) to my dad. (laughs) And now it's time to check our voicemail box. My name is Nathaniel. I'm calling because I'm a college student and uh, my summer internship just got canceled because of this whole coronavirus situation. And I'm, I'm sort of, in, I'm interested in ag culture, especially sort of urban agriculture. And I'm still sort of wondering what you guys think is out there for college students who are, you know, trying to navigate this whole pandemic situation and still want to, you know, get some work experience and, and learn more about the industry. So really appreciate your thoughts on that. Thanks. Hey, Nathaniel, thanks for your message. Really appreciate you calling in and feel terrible, you know, that you lost your internship. That's a real bummer deal. Um, And definitely hearing about other people that are uh, facing that same situation. But I do think that there's definitely a lot of opportunity for you to at least maintain a lot of your personal growth and growth within the ag industry and learning. You know, that's really great that you're interested in and really have a good passion for your specific components of ag here. So, you know, some takeaways and, and things that I thought of, like, you know, there's a lot of different online courses and, and YouTube videos and different resources there to continue to learn and to, gather, to continue to gather more insights into sustainable ag. And I think you could, you know, harness that learning, but then document what you're learning, what you do learn and share that share that through your own channels, be able to help others and, you know, package and give away that knowledge as you continue to learn and become more of a thought leader yourself. Um, I think there's definitely opportunity to go out and visit farms or visit some of these other, um, you know, food producing um, communities and stuff that you're interested in. So I definitely think you could do that. And I mean, it not ideal, but can definitely go and, you know, live at home for the summer and just get a a different local job as much as you can, at least to be able to have them still maintain some revenue throughout the summer. Um, but be able to, to live at home and try to cut expenses that way. I think the, the key here is making the most of the opportunity or not the opportunity, but making the most of the situation and uh, continuing to move forward. And we wish you the best. All right. Well, that's it for fieldwork today. Thanks to all the people who make fieldwork possible. Annie Baxter, Amy Scotches Cole, Claire Jones, Noah Boston, Christian Schmidt, Eric Romani, and Lauren Humpert. Our theme song is written and performed by Johnny Vince Evans with help from Corey Shreppel. Thanks today to our friends at Farm Journal for helping us to get connected with Chip Flory. And uh, there's more to come on our collaboration with Farm Journal. We're really excited to work closely with them. Of course, our website is fieldworktalk.org we're all over the social interwebs at fieldwork talk on youtube twitter facebook and instagram if you like the show it'd be awesome if you would write us um, a review and we'd love to get a voicemail of course from you too leave us a comment or a question at 651-228-4810 at 651-228-4810 thanks for listening and stay safe out there